Right, so unifying cover enclosure when using different verification techniques. This is going to be fairly whistle-stop talk because I was told it was going to be 20 minutes and usually I get asked lots of awkward questions and that usually takes longer than the actual presentation itself. So first steps is what everyone pretty much is used to. Verification has lots of different approaches and different techniques. You've got random, which usually involves very large sets of um, functional coverage to say what stimuli you've actually applied. You may have formal, so that may be leveraging um, assertions which you've put into your design and run at runtime. It may be a full formal proof which you run additionally afterwards. You can have directed testing, whether that's at SOC level, where your um, block's being run in part of a larger system, maybe at a lower level directed test. You might also want to do um, fault insertion, so using things such as uh, certitude for injecting faults and testing how well your um, test bench is working. There are other techniques you may be using or wish to look at. You may have mixed signal simulations and so maybe an element of um, hand checking signal timing, all sorts of other things you want to do, but it's together that they come and uh, give you your verification result. So all are aiming to do the same thing which is basically prove that a given feature or requirement works and prove it over a range of conditions. And the key thing we want to have at the end of this is a plan where if all the checks were switched off and fully random stimuli were applied, your plan doesn't pass. Too often, especially with random simulation, the technique is to have an absolutely massive functional verification model with lots of combinations which take ages to hit, yet if I actually accidentally disable all of your checks and ran something completely random, I could potentially hit the same thing and get a pass without actually having checked anything. So, the first thing is to create a plan, which ideally is independent of the verification tooling. And here I have an example from the sure sign. And as I mentioned there, no backhanders from TVS Honest. There are other planning tools available, each with their own advantages, foibles, disadvantages. But uh, we've been developing a flow using this. And the first thing you need to do is go through your ITS or your set of requirements and break it down for what you are testing. Some of your requirements or features are going to be quite high level and going to require multiple independent checks. Some may just need one. But all features in your list of things to be tested have to have at least one, wrong, one check there. Otherwise, what are you actually doing in your verification? And then for these um, features, you add goals, and these goals then map to the coverage. So that coverage can be a check which is passing. It could be uh, uh, one or more, one or more checks in other um, cross coverage, for example, to prove that something's been checked over a range of conditions. You might want to map down to assertions. So if you have a look at this slide set here, you can see we've used like uh, properties, assertions cross coverage, directed tests, toggle coverage, whatever you actually require. Thank you. So at this point you're trying you're you're trying to say what techniques you um, aim to test things in. You may want to test them with more than one technique, you may be with an assertion, um, your choice, but it's just a plan at this stage about how you're going to go about it. Directed tests. Often people say it should be fully random, but there are cases where directed tests make sense, and if that's the case, use them. It doesn't mean we should completely ignore it. And if you have things where you can't easily import coverage, we can still have um, what this tool calls manual sign-off, where we can say for a given regression we have to see something pass. I have a log file or an example from some other tool, might be some timing information, maybe a waveform, but I can then um, put that into a version tracking system and link to a particular version and say if that is there, that is um, my proof. And what we're looking for here is a system which can load any UCIS compliant results and in that way we can use different tools from different vendors and load, the tool, load all the results into uh, one place without worrying about trying to exchange data between them. So, coverage closure, which is just a nice way of saying we've actually kind of got to the end result. <laughs> what, so what we have here with this plan, hopefully now, is a combined view of all of the coverage from all of the tools in one location. 
And so a regression at this point has a particular meaning. It's no longer I've just run uh, one set of random tests. It is I've run everything associated with that particular RTL release. So that I've run the properties for it. I've done any of the um, manual checks I wish to do. Whatever I wish to check in and say is passing, that now constitutes the regression. Hopefully, if we've used this tool correctly, you can use it to say um, whether we're checking things multiple times. So for example, um, some of the formal tools these days will give you structural coverage information to say what parts of the design you're actually checking. If you've got something which is fully um, checked formally, then you can see that within such a tool, and you don't then have to chase down um, your structural coverage, say, from your simulation side to um, hit lines of coverage you haven't already hit. So you can try and use it to um, minimize the amount of overlap. So, so the basic aim of this also is to track things over time. So as I um, get new code releases and I run more regressions, you should be able to uh, see how your coverage as a whole is improving over time rather than just saying the pass rates on my uh, simulations are getting fast, uh, getting better or my, uh, I have more properties passing. So the point is we want um, coverage closure ideally to be done in a tool independent way. If you're with a, a big vendor, oh well, sorry, with a, with a big company, license deals can change and so you may find you're working with one simulation flow and then suddenly almost instantaneously you have to switch over and that can be painful and if you've locked yourself into one vendor's solution you want to make sure that whatever you're doing can move over without needing to uh, invest a lot of time. And if it is done in an independent way you can bring tools in from uh, various, um, various vendors. So if you're looking at your tooling, you want something which supports the uh, UCIS standard. So certainly the big uh, simulation tools from Mentor and Incisive allow you to do this to a greater or lesser degree. They normally all supply an API you can leverage uh, or other tools. Um, for example, we use the formal tool OneSpin that allows you to export um, their data as a UCS XML for importing into other ones. So if you wanted to use uh, the latest fee manager, you could load that data into that as well. It doesn't mean you're locked to uh, one particular tool. And bringing all of the data together makes it easier to prove that your requirements have all been tested. I've got the requirements coming in at the top. I've then broken that down into my plan. I can quite easily see by going through that list because it's given me a percentage to say, have I mapped it to something? Have I actually got something for each and every requirement coming down. It may be one thing, it may be multiple, but in that way within the tool I can prove that all of my requirements coming in have been signed off, uh, have been covered and I can extract a report at the end of it to basically tabulate all of that data and show it and um, we've uh, used that in our auditing processes to actually achieve the uh, sign off we require. So we've stuck it in front of a data auditor from TUF and then said, look, this proves that these requirements were actually met and it's gone through a certification flow. And that basically is it. It's not rocket science, it's kind of basic engineering, but there's an awful lot of it which isn't done by default. <laughs> Any questions? There is a human being involved, but that. Okay, so the question was um, the tool snapshot at the beginning looked like it was manually entered. Um, that's kind of error prone, and how is that done? So we usually have a requirements database where all your requirements for your entire system or chip are captured. And the way we do that is to then extract that into an XML list and we have an automated tool which then breaks that down into lots of smaller sets per IP and that set of requirements is then imported into the top level and forms the initial set of um, features if you like and then it's a manual case of going through that and breaking it down into smaller features or things that can actually be um, usefully tested. Yeah, so it's a, it's a database format which we write it in. 
there are you know, a number of tools out there you can use. So take your pick. So those requirements also, so the question was, um, is that readable? Are the requirements readable? Because the customer usually wants a spec. So those requirements will also go to the concept engineers, and the concept engineers will write a traditional spec, but they will then need to demonstrate that um, that spec actually covers all of the requirements. They will have some kind of tagging in that ITS and saying this section covers that um, requirement, and it's that um, more lengthy written document which will go to your customer. There's a map. There, yeah. So there's a there's a mapping in there, and the idea is we. With all of these, at the end of your flow, you want something to sit there and say, I have this feature, it's in that document, it is covered in this plan, and this plan then links to this check and this coverage to prove that it was um, there and working. Okay, so the question is, does UCIS work and is there a waiver flow in place? So UCIS does work, it allows you to export all of your um, structural and functional coverage. So we can extract all of that from, um, we, we, we tested it with both Mentor and Cadence products and got it into this and from OneSpin products. Um, the one thing to be wary of is this, if you've got you know, three or four hundred thousand coverage points, because we're loading it into a database, it takes time. Yeah, so it's not something you necessarily want to be doing absolutely every time, you might want to be a little bit more clever with it. As for waivers, that depends more on the um, vendors, on how they allow you to access the information. So the example we've been using is the Cadence solution, and their standard API does not export their filter information because they store it in a vRefine file and it's not by default available through the UCIS. However, we have worked with them and there is a flow in there to allow that, and I think that's going into their 15 point, that's in the 15.2 release. But the structures are in place within the UCIS format to mark something as being um, filtered and for their, whatever comments you wish to embed with that to be ported across as well. So then when you would have a look in this tool, you can say I've got 100% structural coverage, but that's um, justified including your filters. That should be dependent, you know, so the question was, is there consistency between the uh, coverage when using different tools? Basically, if you're following the UCS structure and um, exporting it, it should be identical between different um, CMAs, because def it's defined in the standard, this is how you go through some RTL and layer types and um, exchange information. Um, one thing you do need to be careful of is, particularly with formal, there is, you can't just read the numbers um, in and say that's the figure because particularly for um, property coverage there is associated information. So you can have a property which um, passes but is vacuous so, or a property which fails. So as all of those three pieces of information will be recorded for a property item, you can see there's some mutual exclusivity there. So it's not just a question of reading in the numbers, there has to be a degree of interpretation put on top of that by the tooling that's using it. For Property checking, that's the only one we've used. Um, in theory, you could get it from the um, cadence tooling, but that's because they will automatically write um, information from their formal tooling into a UCM file, UCD file, and you can read that via a UCS API. You mentioned in the talk about signing off a requirement or a feature using maybe different techniques. What about signing them off at different levels of hierarchy in the verification or different times in the Okay. Is that possible? It is, but that's more of a methodology question. So when we have a, um, a requirement, we typically what levels we want it verified. So it may be verified entirely at the IP level, or you may need additional checking, say, at a subsystem or SOC level. And so the requirement will be marked as being needing verification at each of those different levels. So then when we do the um, breakdown and extraction into the small files, it's not broken down just by IP, it's broken down by where it's going to be tested as well. Um, then when we come to our final check at the end, you actually require it to have been covered at each of the levels you said it was going to be um, 
checked at and only when you've done it at each of those levels is it actually marked as signed off. Okay. okay.